It took several hours of coding and entering data to decipher Apple's new sleep score. However, now we know how it is calculated, well, more or less. And there's some more news to share about Apple's new blood pressure feature as well. So let's get to it. I actually entered all information on about 75 nights of sleep score in this large Excel file right here. This cost me a lot of time. So we have our total sleep score here on the left, which is split into three parts the duration sleep score, the bedtime sleep score, and the interruption sleep score. And the duration sleep score here has a maximum of 50 points, the bedtime sleep score a maximum of 30 points, and the interruption sleep score a maximum of 20 points. And those combined make a maximum of 100 points. And let's start with the duration sleep score. So did you get enough sleep? But it's not just about enough sleep, it's also about the sleep stages. So did you get enough REM sleep and enough deep sleep? If you got a low REM sleep score or a low deep sleep score for each of these five points are deducted. So for these nights right here, for instance, I got 40 points. I got enough sleep, but there was a low REM score and a low deep sleep score. So for both of those, five points were deducted and I was only left with 40 points for that night. Now the rest of that sleep duration score then depends on the amount of sleep that I get. You get the total sleep score if you sleep at least for about seven hours or 50 minutes, but I can actually show you that in a nice graph. And here we have all those data points. Now initially I actually thought eight hours of sleep would be the cutoff, so I calibrated it to that. So the zero, zero, zero right here means I got exactly eight hours of sleep. Anything above that is more hours of sleep and anything below it is less hours of sleep. So you're never punished for having too much sleep, but you are punished for having little sleep. And you can see that the first deduction in that duration sleep score happens when sleeping about 10 minutes less than eight hours. So at about seven hours, 50 minutes. And then here in the beginning, it seems to somewhat linearly decrease and then maybe even decrease a little bit faster. So you can see that sleeping about two hours less than eight hours, so six hours, results in a reduction of the sleep score of about 13 points. So you end up with about 37 out of 50 points remaining. So it's not even really a linear decrease, but it seems to even decrease a tiny bit faster as you sleep less and less. Now in this data set, I never slept less than about five hours, 45 minutes. So I don't have data for very short nights, but you can probably more or less deduce the trends from this right here. So in terms of sleep duration score, it's pretty straightforward. So it's a combination of too little REM or deep sleep plus hours of sleep lost somehow after seven hours and 50 minutes or so. But let's next take a look at that bedtime or sleep consistency score. And that's plotted right here. So the maximum score you can get for that is 30 points. And the zero point is right here. If you go to bed up to 15 minutes later than normal, you're not punished in your bedtime score. You still get the full 30 points. But after that, it's a slow decrease in the points that you get. So based on this, I expect that going to bed about an hour later than normal will cost you about 10 points. Interestingly though, going to bed earlier isn't punished much unless you go to bed way earlier. So up to about an hour, there's no punishment, but then slowly your bedtime score does start decreasing and maybe the maximum punishment you get is about six points or so. So even when I went to bed one time, almost four hours earlier than normal, there was no real punishment. And apparently there's also no jet lag punishment, but this is just what I heard. I'm not sure exactly how this works. So in terms of bad time, going to bed earlier only sometimes results in a reduction of your bedtime score, but going to bed later quite quickly. So after 15 minutes results in a reduction of that score. And it seems to be more or less linear. Now I never went to bed about two and a half hours later but that seems to be about the zero point. So I expect going to bed two and a half hours later or more than normal would result in a bedtime score of zero. And to close off, let's take a look at the interruption sleep score. Now this is actually a combination of two things, your total time spent awake during the night and also the number of sleep interruptions detected. So the number of times you woke up. So I made this 3D plot right here with the interruption sleep score along the Z axis. So let's first take a look at awake time. So you can see that awake time more or less results in a linear decrease. 
Of course, there's some points below this as well, where it does appear that up to about 11 minutes of awake time, there's no deduction in your interruption sleep score. And after that, it sort of linearly decreases, where it does appear that around 50 minutes of awake time or so, maybe a little bit more, you get about half the points you would normally get. So a 10 point deduction in your interruption sleep score. Though, of course, this is also a combination of the number of interruptions, so it's hard to say. So let's now take a look at that number of interruptions. And we have the number of interruptions along the horizontal axis now and the interruption sleep score along the vertical axis. And it does appear as though up until maybe two interruptions, there's no punishment on your interruption sleep score. And after that, it slowly decreases. So three and four maybe result in a deduction of one point. Five might result in a deduction of two points. And after that, it's somewhat hard to say because with more interruptions, there's more awake time as well. So it's always a combination of these two. So it's hard to model them independently, but I think it's a pretty clear trend right here. So it might even be a linear decrease like this, where maybe every two interruptions results in a one point deduction. But that's just my expectation. And for the very few of you that are interested, I actually created those graphs in this programming language called R right here. By the way, if anybody is super interested, I'll try to find a way of sharing the raw data as well. I think this helps us pretty much decipher the sleep score. There's still a few unknowns, but we basically know how it's calculated. By the way, for those of you who are new to the channel, my name is Rob and I'm a postdoctoral scientist specializing in biological data analysis. Now next, I wanna share some information on the blood pressure feature. And this information I actually got from my friend Killian, who, when du Deutsch sprichst, you might know from the channel I know review or the English channel Orbit, so a shout out to him. The blood pressure feature of Apple doesn't actually detect your blood pressure as in those numeric values. Instead, it gives you a warning if you might have an elevated blood pressure. Now we don't know any thresholds for this, so when Apple calls something a high blood pressure, if you get a warning from your Apple Watch, you're recommended to use an at-home blood pressure device for seven days in the morning and evening. And based on this, they then recommend you make the decision to go to the doctor or not. Now, in general, I think this kind of setup makes sense since actual reliable blood pressure measurements are super hard to do from the wrist. At least if you're just able to use those green and red lights under your watch, so the optical heart rate sensor. I think that at the moment, at least to get reliable blood pressure measurements, so those actual numbers, there needs to be some kind of inflation of a cuff. So normally you do it on the biceps and there are some devices that can do it on the wrist, but they actually pump up something to measure your blood pressure. So in that sense, I think an Apple watch will be more reliable than a Samsung watch, for instance, because the Samsung watch actually tries to estimate your actual blood pressure. And I think this is not very reliable, at least in my testing, it hasn't been. Now, I also discussed this sleep score with Killian, and he made some good points about strain and recovery not really being a part of Apple sleep score. Say you have a super hard workout today, your heart rate variability is likely a bit lower and you might need more sleep and more recovery. However, none of this seems to be taken into account by Apple sleep score. So it's somewhat disconnected from your exertion and your recovery. So it's really just a sleep score independent of your behavior and your heart rate variability. Other devices like Aura and Whoop do try to take this into account more and usually also provide a separate score that takes more of the strain part into account. So those are just some thoughts on the sleep score. By the way, if you want to support the channel, the best way of directly doing that is by becoming a YouTube member, which you can find up here. It's basically Patreon on YouTube. And it really does help since I, for instance, just ordered about 2000 euros worth of Apple watches just for the upcoming reviews in the next few weeks. And with that in mind, also please consider subscribing or using one of my affiliate links down below, even just for Amazon, which in many cases gives you the best discount possible and directly helps supporting the channel without ever costing you any extra. In the meantime, check out this video on the new Polar Loop, which is a super popular device, or this video on the HSleep Pod, my favorite sleep improvement device.